I'm Kate Clanchy and this is my book, Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, which is shortlisted for the All World Prize. Um, all books have a kind of starting point. Uh, this book started 10 years ago when I was teaching in the inclusion unit of my local school. Um, and it started with this piece. I'm just going to read a short bit of it. Um, I've been a teacher since I was 21. I've always taught in state schools, but I think an inclusion unit is new to, you know, many teachers don't go there. I hadn't been there. Um, actually, it was quite a new concept 10 years ago. And I thought of it as, you know, the exclusion unit, because in a way, that's what it is. The kids in there are there because they have the superpower of making life impossible for any, for the kids and the other teachers around them. So it's the kids that would otherwise be excluded. But when I was there, I'm, I met a teacher that showed me that it, inclusion was a real thing, that what she was actually doing was taking these kids and putting them inside a community and how supportive and amazing that was. Um, this is a short bit of writing from when I'm inside the inclusion unit, it's Christmas, or just after Christmas. So um, I'm, I'm just telling you that I, I feel unqualified and embarrassed quite often with the kids writing. I feel embarrassed. I become aware of my greedy writerly curiosity. Nevertheless, here are the kids and here am I, and there is no point in studying the sonnet here. So after a few Dove sessions, we've come up with a system. I read them something aloud. They love like little children to be read to. And in the brief piece afterwards, they write things down, a version of what we've read usually, something in a strong rhetorical frame that makes their hesitant thoughts sound grand and fine. Then Miss B and I gather up the scribbles and file them, affirming as loudly and firmly as possible as we go. We have to do this, otherwise they will destroy their work, because all of them, for all their bluster, have low self-esteem. In the same way they cannot sit exams, get to school on time, or shift from radiators, the excluded are unable to redraft their own work, because that would involve reading it, and as they wrote it, they know it is not worth doing so. So each week, I type and arrange their written pieces nicely on an A3 sheet. I take their names off. That way, when we read them, they can see past their own unworthiness and notice that their work is good. Today, the story is a Julie Oranger one called Note to Sixth Grade Self. It's quite long, which will be restful for them after that exam. And I think they'll like the setting too, in America, in a high school where soap opera teenagehood happens. We'll listen to the story, and maybe Simon will tell us some more about his childhood, that savage nearby hinterland full of dens and fires. Of all the excluded, Simon interests me most. He's so bright and mercurial and so full of stories. But Simon isn't talking today, let alone leaning back in his chair and telling us spellbinding tales of arrest and arson. He isn't in affirmation mood either when he urges the others on in their work weeps at their testimony and writes himself ringing prompts to resist peer pressure and move on and get qualifications and a job. He's dragged himself to the central table, but he's still plugging his earphones in and out, dumping his head in his hands. Eventually he goes out to the lobby and sits with Mrs N. Tom starts another drawing, asking dutiful permission first. The others, though, are writing like mad, except the ones who are crying, because I've really overdone it this time. Julie Oranger hit a hell of a nerve, or maybe even it was the exam, but something is loose in the room, something dark. Dave is writing to his 10-year-old, tortured, probably autistic self, about to throw a chair at a teacher. Throw harder, he writes, think about it, aim. This is like relief. Elsewhere, the excluded are remembering being shut in cupboards, knife attacks, sexual assaults, and over and over, abuse by their parents, Abuse which ranges from simple neglect and abandonment through complicated excluding and scapegoating, goating, all the way to sexual abuse, and prostitution and outright criminal violence. The accounts have the poor spelling, incontinent exclamation marks and artless detail of truth. I slid down the stairs on my bum so they wouldn't hear me. You could see the blood on the carpets in track marks like a car. It was the big knife out the drawer in the kitchen. He was my mum's friend. I know him all my life. However unglamorous these kids, the stories on the crumpled bits of A4 are stark and clear as any Hollywood movie. Here in black and white, 
is the liberal creed about children. No one is bad, though many are sad and a few are mad. Dave acts like a cornered dog because he's been kicked like a dog. Vicky's comfort zone is small because she's been comforted so little. Kylie laughs at you when you ask her to be a normal girl because she knows she comes from a socially despised family. Clarice controls her world through starving her body because her body has been taken out of her control. That children only do as they are done to and generally less. That children can escape the legacy of their parents and change. This is the founding myth of the inclusion unit. And walking around the classroom, poring over writing, removing apostrophes, passing the tissues, I believe it. Certainly nothing the excluded have done, no bit of damage to desk, carpet or person is anything compared to the damage done to them. For lack of something better to say, I repeat this to them. All of them are trying to do better, are doing better, are capable of kindness too. As a group, they are strikingly nice, as Miss B often comments, to each other, much more so than most children in their circumstances. I think that's fascinating, Kate. Um, I, I was going to read something which actually links incredibly well, and it, yeah. it shows, I think there's a sort of universality to these stories. Um, I'm Rachel Sylvester, and I'm a columnist on The Times, and normally I write about politics, but I started writing about exclusion and knife crime because I saw a knife attack when I was driving to drop my son at football training one night. It was a couple of years ago in Hackney. Um, and we were just driving down the road and a guy ran across the road chasing, it was two guys with huge machetes chasing another man, boy. They were probably 15, 14, something like that. Um, and I pulled over called 999. Uh, obviously by then the, they'd gone, but the police rang me back and they said that somebody had ended up in hospital and could I give any descriptions. So I started looking into the whole issue and very, very quickly it came to exclusion and the link between mm. knife crime and e exclusion. Um, so I, I was going to read something from a piece I wrote last November and it's about a programme called The Difference, which is takes high-flying graduates mm. and, and sends them into alternative provision schools. It's a bit like Teach First, but for AP. Exclusion unit, yeah, AP. Yeah, exclusion units of alternative provision. Um, six months ago, Jack Weston was living in California, teaching the children of tech billionaires at the International School in Palo Alto, within cycling distance of the Facebook and Google headquarters. When his pupils weren't in lessons, they were being shuttled between violin, mandarin and gym classes. Everybody had swimming pools and yoga studios, chefs and nannies. And at Christmas, one parent slipped $150 into his car to thank him for his hard work. He told me it's actually a bit insulting when he realised how much they earned. Now, the 26-year-old chemistry graduate is working in a pupil referral unit in Kent, teaching children who've been excluded from mainstream schools. They're some of the most difficult and disruptive pupils in the country. Some can barely read or write. Many are violent or disturbed. At least one was sent to the school to escape from a gang. Nobody is wealthy. A mother told him recently that she couldn't afford to buy her son a new uniform because she had only 15 pounds left in her bank account. In Palo Alto, you have all the helicopter parents on your case as a teacher all the time, Weston says. The children are hyper-parented to the point where they have less time off than I do as a teacher. Here, parents have no influence on them. There's often nobody in their lives. It sometimes feels as if you as the teacher are the only person who cares about them and wants them to do well. He's only been at the school for a few weeks, but he's already had a chair thrown at him and had to talk a boy down off the roof. That student has a very difficult home life, he says. His parents aren't around, and when I see him at lunch, he eats more than anyone because he obviously doesn't get fed that much at home. He wasn't seeking attention, he just wanted to get away from everything. In his first lesson with one class, two pupils got up and walked out. Since then, he's been sworn at repeatedly. They'll sit there and refuse to do their work. They'll call you all sorts of names to try to get a reaction. But after a few lessons, they give up. Nothing shocks him anymore. He says, when I go to the pub on a Friday, everybody wants to hear my stories. Instead of handing out detentions, he tries to work out and uh, work out and understand what's going on. Many of these kids are in care. Some have parents with long-term addictions or who are involved in prostitution. 
There are absent fathers, kids with no parents at all, parents in prison, abusive parents. One boy came into the school and started walking around the corridors, smashing things up, punching and kicking the walls and doors. Jack said, I sat with him and said, what's going on? It turned out that he'd been evicted from his house. He had nowhere to live. He was sleeping on a friend's sofa. Many of the children have witnessed domestic abuse. Violence is a learnt behaviour, he says. Often violent children um, come from violent homes. There's just a few figures here. The number of children removed from mainstream education is growing. More than 40 pupils in England are permanently excluded every school day. And in 2016 to 17, there were 7,720 permanent exclusions, a rise of 50%, 56% over three years. And Anne Longfield, the Children's Commissioner, has estimated that almost 60,000 children are supposedly being homeschooled, but have effectively been lost by the system after being re removed from the registers of mainstream, mainstream schools. There are, they are, she warns, vulnerable to exploitation by gangs, and some pupil referral units have become a re recruiting ground for criminals. I, I wanted to ask you, Kate, do you feel frightened when you go into work ever? in these in these units no 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 i mean i i i go, I go in as a um an, an occasional person there's staff there who really know what they're doing um and i don't and i think there's a kind of fear of being um you know people who are strangers to teaching and who go into even a mainstream classroom there is that fear of being taken down and insulted in a kind of deep primary way that actually hasn't happened to you since you were 10. I, I don't have that fear because I, I have never stopped doing that. So I've, I've been in those environments as a teacher where, where that can happen to you. And it doesn't stop hurting exactly, but it happens to you a lot less somehow or other. It's, I always say to people, it's a bit like being a beekeeper. There's a certain amount of humiliation and terrible things that happen to you in the first couple of years of being a teacher. And if you go through that, I think especially if you go through that when you're young, it's really hard to start that when you're older. You, you simply approach the bees differently and you can't say what it is that you're doing to the bees exactly. You couldn't put it in words, but the, I have that thing when I go into a group of teenagers that they know I'm a teacher. Right. You talk about it as sort of the confidence trick of discipline. I yeah. love this, like the suspension of disbelief on both sides. Yeah, it is. I mean, you have to, you, you, there's really not a lot you could do to stop them. There's not really a good reason why they will do what you do. Yeah. You just have to believe it. Um, and that's why, you know, teaching is, is difficult to learn. It's not, it's not as simple as having the knowledge and going in and transferring it. It's a huge level of physical skills. So one of the things actually the Zoom teaching makes me think, you know, um, there, there are things you can do well online um, teaching, but the kind of the grip on the room, the, all of those skills, they're just not transferable. It's to do with, you know, how you feel with people and the things that you're giving back, how you can hold the group. And also, you know, a school is a much bigger thing. A school is a community. Um, that's why we need the schools, the kids to go back, because they need to go back to this community that holds them. Um, and, you know, those kids that you were talking about there, they're the mm. ones that we're really, I'm really frightened for now. I don't yeah. know, those vulnerable children already lost, they're going to be lost, uh, much lot more lost. Yeah. Uh, you know, social services even going to be, even going to be able to find them at all. Yeah. And I spoke they... to another, um, the head of another alternative provision school, which is actually a boxing academy, and they mm. operate by, they teach every day, all the children do some boxing. And the idea is that this is in, in Hackney and a lot of mm. them were in gangs. In fact, some of them still are, you know, they usually have a couple of kids missing because they're out on county lines in normal day mm. um, and then one kid the day I went to visit a kid had been stabbed on the way to school the day before the, you know they're really in the thick of it but um, they get extraordinary results through this sort of discipline of boxing but I um, emailed her when the lockdown the day the lockdown started and I said look your kids are supposed to be there they're supposedly vulnerable kids you know in theory education mm. continues she said well why should they you know there's absolutely no way they're going to come to school when they know nobody else is coming to school. They're the Absolutely. least, the last, you know, the last who are going to come. So it's, it's a real, I think you're right, it's really worrying. Yeah, it's a real, you know, it's a mark of, it's like school dinners, um, that kids would rather not take them than be marked yeah. out as having them. Um, yeah. I think probably the schools that have done the best have been primary schools with a very large number of vulnerable kids, you know, with sort of 40%, which you get sometimes. I think then you get some reasonable amount of attendance because then the community is still there. 
yeah. but to um you know to be in a small room with the teacher is probably what the, what they're most scared of these these students in the first place so the ones that it takes a whole machine and a whole community to get in in the first place and yes. I, I, I'm sure they haven't been there. No. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to refind them. And also, you don't know, they're the ones who are most vulnerable at home with domestic violence mm. or vulnerable to recruitment by gangs because they're looking for that kind of community. Well, I mean, also being used by their family in different ways, that's extremely common. Mm. So to, to be carers for unwell parents and therefore yeah. to be in alternative provision, that's really quite common. Or to be mm. the translator person in the family, the person that's holding it all together, to look after younger siblings. Or all of those things happen particularly to girls. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of ways where, you know, it, if you have a sort of socially excluded family, the gravity downwards, the gravity to just stay in is huge. And I think everything about the pandemic will have made that gravity heavier, will have made that pull stronger. And also the more I've sort of written about this and researched it, the more you realise that each of these children is one bit of a family and they, mm. there's a whole network behind each individual child, which is often in itself quite troubled. Uh, yeah. And then a network of other friends. And one reason they often get dragged into gangs is because they're looking for some kind of replacement family or community. And, and for, a, set, and for a, a source of self-esteem and pride. Yeah. And, they they know their families are despised and you just think what an awful feeling that is and think yeah. how you know how strongly we do we kind of pretend that we're a society of individuals but i think families are very 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 strong mm -hmm. and if you especially for teenagers and we do tend as a society to focus on teenagers and say they've got this disorder or that disorder but i've never known a teenager have a disorder on their own they, they, they were, yeah. they've got disorders that come from their family pressures and you need to look at the whole group and mm. they need very much to be part of a, a strong family to have. And, in, you know, inclusion mm. units can supply that. Mm. Mm. But they need you to be very... You, there's very one of the lines in your book about the, anything they've done is as nothing compared to what's been done to them. Or words, but yeah. I'm paraphrasing, you say it better. Yeah. But that kind of, the sense that they're victims as well as perpetrators is really strong, I think. Always, always. And I think that's mm. true of bullying as well. I mean... When you treat bullying, you tend to say this child has been bullied and this child is a bully. But those right. patterns that people engage in, bullies can't help it quite often. And right. the feelings the feelings that they get filled with as they do acts of cruelty are also extremely hard to deal with. And again, that's something about, you know, dealing with the whole group and dealing with the whole family and, and trying to give people safe spaces and spaces to mm -hmm. talk. It's just an enormous problem i mean it's saying we've got it's about poverty and disadvantage yeah. in general yeah and what made me really cross as well was that sense that these children are so often written off by the government and the mm. department for education that sees everything in terms of what exam grades are you going to get you know so a lot of these mm. um schools particularly the sort of supposedly high achieving schools in terms of academic mm. grades they'll do the as quickly as they can boot these children out or exclude them so they don't they don't feature on their their list of grades in their league table mm. um, so they boot to try and boost their ratings um, and actually it's so short-sighted for society as a whole in the end it, it, even in in sort of financial terms the cost of a child in a um, young offenders institute is something like £76,000 a year compared mm. to maybe you might spend 20,000 on a really good alternative provision school. It's just so, the cost of that child over their lifetime, if they really go off the rails, is phenomenal. Let alone the sort of emotional cost, the social cost, the, the, you know, the cost in lives if they end up stabbing someone. Uh, and it feels so kind of narrow, the definition of success sometimes in the education system. Well, it's partly um, one of the things that we've done over the last decade. It, I mean, it, it's actually started with the with the Labour government before that is to fracture the education system and to say we've got these competing trusts and then these competing schools. And the definition of success, as you say, is five GCSEs. So actually mm -hmm. it, it, to hold on to the excluded, hold on to Simon and Kylie is, is mm -hmm. expensive for a school. And what happened to that? exceptional inclusion unit that I'm writing about there with the astonishing Miss B was that the next year it was the school was taken over by Academy Trust and in order to achieve turnaround her inclusion unit was destroyed 
Right. And she, I mean, she, her life was destroyed. She went to hospital. She was so stressed. Mm. It was, it was a really terrible thing to see. And the next uh, generation and it, of yeah. and sons were pregnant three years young, younger or whatever. Well, I mean, they, they, mm. they, they, they can be made to disappear, those children. You can off roll them and exclude them for lots and lots of reasons. Yeah. And one of the reasons that, you know, you get, you get, it's actually quite easy to exclude kids like that because there's no one to stand up to them. If you're going to, there are laws against informal include, um, exclusion, but you need to, you know, more or less have a degree in order to be able to operate them. Well, and also the government seems to be able to say the parents are told you, your school, your child now needs to be home educated, and they're allowed mm. to. I think it's absolutely extraordinary. There's no register of children who are homeschooled. It's completely. Well, think, yeah, but there is um, locally. Home, home, yeah, homeschooling is a real problem because when mm. people raise homeschooling, you get middle class people who are effectively very, very privately educating their children, you know, educating yeah. them, in, you know, very often very well, and that's what you hear from. But it's more often used as an abuse. Yeah. So they take the child off the school register when they know that you're coming for them with the social mm. work. Mm. It's a really awful thing. Uh, I went, I spent one day with the Ofsted inspectors who specialize in alternative provision and mm. just talking to them about the horrendous facilities in some of these places and the horrendous quality in fact some of them aren't inspected at all because yeah. there's sort of weird whole weird set of loopholes as far as I can work out they're completely illogical they should be the most they should be top of the list for inspection and the most focused and the most and the most high quality people in them and yeah. the best teachers exactly yeah. but bottom of the pile and everything but the school, I went to one school, it was a primary school actually for excluded primary children. And um, it was actually run by the local authority, but it was unregistered. And it was mm. just shocking that, I mean, the, the, it was an utter mm. chaos. The neighbours had rung up offset to complain that children were, as they called it, escaping out of the window. <laughs> and, you know, when we turned up unannounced, there were, you know, there's sort of children wandering around with paint on their hands, utter, so it just had a sort of totally anarchic feeling, swearing at each other, um, pet teachers desperately trying to keep control. Mm. And that was mm. run by the local authority. So there seems even the, the, the sort of official authorities seem mm. to have completely lost a grip on this. Yeah, and Academy Trust run ones which have bins as well. Um, yeah. and, and local authorities run runs which have bins. Mm. Um, and religious institutions even run ones which have bins. Yeah. Even when you're doing it very well, the figures tend not to look very good. And yes. People just hide behind that. You know. And also, they could be it could be five times better than average, but that still doesn't look fantastic. It still, it still looks terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you think? I thought it was really interesting whether you talked about whether you know the sort of the myth of the inclusion unit or the myth of the sort of liberal chattering class that mm -hmm. these children can effectively be saved. Do you think? that's a myth do you think do you think some of these children are so badly damaged that they're almost beyond salvation i don't believe that anyone's beyond salvation yeah ever and i've never certainly never met a child that was beyond salvation but mm. what i do think is that there's quite a lot of pressure to do things once to achieve turnaround once so right. you know in we go and you know i started from this as a as a writer so you go in an art project and you spend six weeks and then you're supposed to fill in an evaluation form in which they achieve turnaround and then you nip her off again right um, that doesn't yeah. do any good you know i worked mm. 10 years in a school to achieve change and you have to be yeah. there every time and you have to be there the whole yeah. time i mean miss b was the best in inclusion person ever and she was there every single day um and even that wasn't enough they probably needed to be in that unit for you know five years and have miss b there the whole time they need consistency um, yeah. And of course, you, you can achieve turnaround, but I think this appetite for um, turnaround quickly, you know, oh, they've been to a boxing yeah. seminar, they've turned around. oh, they've done an art project, they've turned around, they've written a poem, they've turned around. Yeah. Yeah. They don't do that, you know, they, they need a new uh, initiative, a new youth club, a new... Yeah, yeah. And, and we, do, we, we, do, we do far too much of that. That's really a terrible thing mm. that's happened in education in Britain, is that a headline education, headline yeah. changes. Um, constant churning on the surface within and then the kind of long-term investment and long-term change really hasn't happened. I think the first thing I would do is um, destroy the academy trusts and return schools to local councils and make sure that the laws um, in place for you know who you vote for local council and how you regulate schools were good and strong and then I would make sure that there is one line of responsibility that the council is looking after 
its children um, and then to make sure that that was fantastically well funded so that each local council and, and funded more where you had more deprivation so yeah. that it, you'd, you'd have a school it, it, you don't want to isolate people in small units you want them to be part of the of a school and i'd hope that that school would be a small school actually um you know 400 kids and then maybe there is 20 who are in a in special provision within inside that school that's holding them tight and that school is part of all the other local institutions part of the mums network and the nurseries and the doctor surgery so they're held within that as well there's the the fracturing and the competition and actually honestly the kleptocracy of the academy trusts where they just take so much money and pay themselves lots of it mm. that that really is where i would start i mean i hope that sound doesn't sound too far away but i think unless we do those kind of bigger things these people because they're the most vulnerable they're always just going to be um falling off the edges I think you also don't, you have to see the child in the wider context. So you have to put more money into early intervention in families mm, so that you absolutely. stop the child getting to this point. So all of that stuff has been cut, the cuts to Sure Start, yep. the cuts to early intervention funding. If I were the government, I'd pour millions put money back in there. Yeah. Two, two or three actually before they get to school these children but also much more intensive support for families even if that seems quite intrusive and nanny statish actually sort of helping the families save themselves because Absolutely. i don't think a child on their own they're just the, it's almost like the end of the road by the time the child's in the inclusion unit you have to go way way back the woman who runs the difference charity, Kieran Gill, who's done a lot of work on exclusion and inclusion, she has a really interesting idea, which is a sort of version of the pupil premium, which is paid for on the basis of deprivation, but with a much wider definition. So you have mm. a premium for different kinds of adverse childhood experiences. So it could involve domestic violence or addiction in the family, mental health. And actually, I think it's quite a narrow um, definition of disadvantage at the moment um, and actually a lot of these children come from backgrounds which are deprived in those emotional ways as well as materially uh, so I think you need to also maybe look at that but that would be part of a sort of much bigger special education needs is another huge one yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, just to endorse what you're saying we're not we are getting the non sure start kids in, in secondary school now and they are noticeably more needs noticeably oh, more needs um, that they, these things have that these things have happened. It's got much harder in the last five years as a consequence of austerity, because yeah. you know schools schools are like the only emergency service. These people haven't got the yeah. social the support. Mental health services for young people in this country are disastrous. Mm. It's almost impossible to get people an appointment with CAMS. You know mm. they have to they can they can be on the verge of suicide and get one six months later. Yeah, um, the, 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 those services are just not there. How much do you find writing helps them? I thought it was some of the poems mm. you described them writing was so beautiful. Yeah, I, I mean, I have students from all sorts of backgrounds who write extraordinary poems. Um, I, I, I think it helps. Again, I'm slightly suspicious of that, oh, you're going to write a poem and then, and then you're better uh, impulse. And I don't do it, I don't teach poetry to treat trauma or as mm. therapy i kind of teach poems i always just go in and say we're going to write a poem you know and the poem can be a poem can be a happy poem yeah um over time they don't do it i think you know it, it it's an art and it's an expressive art it's a very cheap art you know it just needs a bit of paper yeah. um and yeah I, th I think many many students do very much enjoy it and i, I wish more english teachers felt empowered to do it mm. I suppose anything that encourages children to express what's inside is has got to be good, hasn't it? If they don't yeah, have many other really. to, to, to hear yourself and to be heard by others is, is mm. surely mm. a healthy thing. Yeah. We teach English too many wow words, too many abstract nouns and all of that. But you have to, you know, that's the thing I tell people. You, you, what, you're the interesting thing. Your truth is the interesting thing. That's going to your own experience. It takes quite a lot of um, you need positive role models as well, especially with um, children of colour. There's this very interesting phenomenon that um, a Bengali girl will always write about a white girl unless you tell her not to. So, yeah. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. I suppose it's about whether you value your experiences as, as a sort of valid subject. And if, they if you feel... want to see them reflected. You know? 
Mm. We need we need lots more literature in the classroom that reflects the full diversity of our classrooms. It has an incredibly powerful effect to go in and show them the work of a black poet um, in 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 a, a diverse group of students. An incredibly powerful effect. It's, mm. Can't can't overstate its importance. Do you see your role as a teacher to somehow heal the traumatic memories, or is it to? It, it, or because I thought it was quite interesting. There's one of the stories where actually you you make clear it, it can be dangerous to get too much out, and you have to. You you've got quite a professional role in the classroom. You're not a therapist. Mm. You have to teach. You're not there to really try and heal these children. I, I no, I mean I think their madness lies if you go in and think you can heal people. Um right. and, and I I wouldn't I wouldn't presume to do that. I mean I don't know how to do that. I don't I think very few people do. Um I, I know how to help people to almost anybody actually, because I have worked with really rough kids and dyslexic kids and kids from um all sorts of backgrounds. I can I can help almost anyone to write a poem that makes their experiences sound good and that's what i aim to do so that they can see and hear their own experiences clearly and thereby i do no harm um and i think very often i do good and then there's something to take away they can see and hear themselves a little bit clearer we're shining a light really as journalists mm, and, and, and i think sort of giving voice to people who don't always have a voice and certainly with this so for me, the experience that came out of something quite shocking, which was seeing a, um, a stabbing about to take place when I was with my young child or, you know, teenage son, um, then to then once I looked into it, I realized how complicated it was. I went out with the gangs unit, with the local police, uh, met some of the gang members, realized how many, what the stories were behind these children. Uh, and then you realise that the, the sort of immediate headline of knife crime, for example, has got so much behind it. And so mm. that's what I want to do as a journalist is to sort of explore the reasons, the real causes of things rather than just the, um, the headline figures. You speak truth to power and that's and a really important, power, exactly. that's really important yeah. thing to do because in, in my inclusion units, I can't get to power. I just do mm. you know, truth to the powerless still helps definitely